Our is Dr. Sarah Sloan. And Sarah and I first met by email a few years ago when somebody noticed a black mass push kit at Page Springs in Malheur National Wildlife, so near the wildlife, just south of it from my BLM. And um, I was there that spring, and two, a couple of people got pretty good pictures of it, so we had evidence. Uh, and I started looking around, and I couldn't find any decent information, explanation about how that happened. Uh, and it's the first record that anybody could find of one in Oregon. If you go to Guatemala, you can find it fairly common, but Oregon, not so much. And these are not migrants, as you know, and she'll talk about that, but they're pretty sedentary. So this bird was obviously local and native to Eastern Oregon. Um, and finally, I realized, uh, looking on Birds of the World, the only account of bush kits that I found that was useful was written by somebody by the name of Sarah Sloan. Uh, so I reached out and she actually answered. Uh, and it led to a fairly interesting article that turns out that occasionally there are young first year, first summer birds that will have a black mask. Not many, not very often. Uh, not as common as the white ring around the neck of a cackling goose, which is about 5%, but much rarer. But anyway, she helped me figure out what was going on. So I did a little piece for the Oregon Birding Association. So since then, we've been in touch occasionally about bush kits. Uh, and I knew that she did research in this area. And I thought, wouldn't it be great to have somebody that can actually tell us about these little guys that come through your garden? And they're so fascinating and they make lots of little twittery noises and they come and go in 30 seconds usually. Uh, and it would be nice to learn more about them than what you see out the window. So here is Dr. Sarah Sloan. Yeah, just clip it onto your. Or you could just hold it, you know, whatever's comfortable. Is this the picture when you yeah. turn the lights on? Well, I love the effects here. <laughs> These are not my effects on the screen. Uh, we'll see how this works. Um, this is a bird that has got to be completely familiar to all of you. Uh, such a common backyard bird, the bush tip, um, sometimes now called the American bush tip, Saltriparus minimus. It's the only New World representative of its family, the age of fallacy. It ranges all the way north from British Columbia, way down into Guatemala, and there are also populations as far east as parts of Texas, especially Big Bend, Texas. Um, everywhere they live, they are resident. They are non migratory birds. The birds you see in the winter are the same birds that are still in the breeding season, which is now. Or arguably, and you can argue with me, your bird probably will. <laughs> the smallest pets are in, in the U.S. They average five and a half grams, which is about half the size of a chickadee. And by the way, they are not at all related to chickadees, even though they have very similar habits, foraging types of habits. They're not related to chickadees. And this is a picture of my hand. So I think you can get an idea of just how small a bush tit is in the hand. They are incredibly small. Now, bush tits, one of the reasons I actually started to study them was the fact that bush tits have the distinction of being one of the very first birds described as having what we call helpers at the nest. And a helper at the nest is an individual that directs parental behaviors, that is, takes care of individuals, kids that are not their own kids. So they're taking care of somebody else's kids, okay? Breeding systems that have helpers in them are called cooperative breeding systems. And about six to nine percent of all bird species um, have uh, cooperative breeders, considered cooperative breeders, although there's quite a bit of variation in that within that depth. Not a simple, there are a lot of variations within it. And by the way, it's not just birds, for example, wolves are considered cooperative breeders, for example. They're Or may not know about bush tits. How many of you have seen bush tits huddling like this? Oh, not very many of you. Okay. Well, bush tits will huddle together in order to stay warm. And they'll do that even on a warm day. So, and studies have shown that even at 20 degrees C, which is sort of your average warm day, 
they burn about 82% less energy than they would, actually 82% ener yeah, less energy than they would if they were alone. So they're saving a great deal of energy by huddling together. This picture was taken by one of my field assistants this year, Jillian Murphy, this March. These are four adults that would have been building, except it's been a very cold spring, right? So these guys said, forget it, we're resting. The other thing you probably know about bush tits, oh, the screen's making this look really weird, but okay, is they build these incredibly spectacular nests. How many of you have seen a bush tit nest? Okay, almost all of you have seen a bush tit nest. Okay, this nest was on Reed campus. It's about a foot long, okay? They can be quite cryptic though. You probably either, sometimes they're super obvious and other times they're very cryptic. Okay. Now, a lot of people, what's this doing here? <laughs> a lot of people refer to bush tit nests as like, like a hanging old sock, right? And, and I, I take offense at that <laughs> because bush tits are not building a hanging sock. They're building a really intricate structure. It's an amazing thing, actually. It's highly structured, it's gourd shaped. Both the male and the female do build the nest. They use as a base, a mixture of lichen and spiderweb. And if you think about spiderweb, you think that it's sticky, right? But it's not sticky. Spiderweb actually, if you look at it with electron microscope has little ridges on it. That's why it sticks to you. It's not like honey, okay? So if you put lichen and spiderweb together, they stick together like Velcro and they can form a fabric. And so that's what bush tits are doing. And actually there are a lot of birds that use lichen and spiderweb, the mix of lichen and spiderweb. In fact, hummingbirds do, goldfinches do. I know that because they steal bush tits nesty material from their nests, but anyway, we won't go there. Um, so they build this, what they do is they build a little platform um, of lichen and spiderweb and they sit in it and they stretch it and they stretch it and they stretch it and they add more and more and more until they have a hanging sack. They add a lot more material. They finally add a hood at the top with an entrance just big enough for a bush tit. Although the other day we had a chickadee leaving a bush tit nest. That was like three days ago, right? I was like, what's going on? Anyway, <laughs> and I don't know what was going on. What's that? Well, we were wondering, checking out the territory, right? So down at the bottom is much thicker. This is very thin material here. It's very stretchy. Down at the bottom is where the nest is. And the final step is they fill this with as many contour or body feathers of other birds that they can find. And I never know where they find them, but they can fill a nest with hundreds of feathers. And I never find them. If, if somebody said, go out and find contour feathers, I'd, I'd be at a loss. Anyway, so we end up with this amazing structure. Here's a bush tit, a study skin from museum study skin, a nest that's actually not as big as the one that I showed you before. You end up with this giant sleeping bag. So it's a really intricate thermal structure. And it allows them to not only sleep in it at night and stay warm, but also to leave the nest for longer, far longer periods of time than most incubating birds can leave a nest because the eggs are very warm inside of this nice, big sleeping bag. Well, they get pretty big and they can kind of crawl up and stick their little heads out and ask for food eventually. <laughs> it works. They fly out, by the way, when they fledge. They're out like a shot, which I can't figure out because they never any, they don't have any the time to exercise their wings, but they fly out. Anyway, the other thing you probably know about bush tits is that there's a dimorphism, sexual dimorphism in eye color. So males have the brown eye color that they all hatch with, by the way. Every single one, males and females, have this eye color. They continue to have that eye color even after fledging. And it isn't until about three weeks to three months after they fledge that the females develop this cream colored or yellow colored eyes. And this is my absolute favorite picture of a bush tit. She's one badass bush tit. I mean, I wouldn't, if she wasn't this big, right? Wouldn't you be terrified of her? All right. So that's the limit of most people's knowledge, I think. Um, they're flocking, they're gregarious, they're friendly, they're tame, they're adorable. 
Um, they're cheerful. I think people have this impression that they're living in these cheerful little flocks. And what I want to do is prove you wrong. <laughs> It's not until you can identify individuals, you can tell Henry from Harvey, that you begin to understand just how complicated the bush tit society actually is. So here is a color banded bush tit, this is what I do. I catch them, I color band them with unique combination of color bands, four, four to each, uh, two to each leg, so they get it four with the US Fish and Wildlife, I mean, used to be US Fish and Wildlife, USGS. Um, band. And once you do that, once you can tell individuals apart, you suddenly realize that things are way more complicated than you thought they were. I give you a little bit of um, the basics that I learned. I, I know, isn't that adorable picture? It's not mine. <laughs> um, but uh, what are the basics about bush tits that I first learned when I first started studying color banded bush tits? Well, I'm going to. Yep, here we go. Right. Well, they do live in flocks. Surprise, surprise. Um, and they, but they live in very cohesive flocks. In other words, the same individuals always stay in the same flock together. Okay. So this is a diagrammatic representation of one flock and another flock. And the flock home ranges overlap quite a bit as they move around. And these flock home ranges can be like a kilometer by kilometer. They can be quite large. Um, and there isn't really any kind of fighting or territoriality if the flocks accidentally run into each other. They may be little chases and stuff, but uh, they don't get particularly violent. Um, I used to say that females <laughs> immigrated out of these flocks and males remained in the natal flock for a lifetime. This year, every year, every single year I've studied bush tits, they have done something different. They've done something new. And this year, the new thing is we have females that have hatched last year in a flock and are still in their natal flock and they're breeding. So the, we have one nest where we had five babies hatch last year. All five survived. That's a little weird to begin with. Two females, three males, all of them each have a nest within the same area. So I don't know what's going on. Thanks, Bush Tits. As soon as I think I know what's going on, they change their minds. All right. The most important thing to remember or to know about bush tits is that their flock structure persists year round. And this is very different from birds like, for example, this uh, singing red winged blackbird here, who lives in a flock during the non breeding season, but then establishes a very strong territory in the breeding season and doesn't let anybody else in. Bush tits don't do that. Bush tits live in their flock structure for the entire year. So even during the breeding season. So when you see a bush tit nest, it's not just two bush tits and they never get to see their buddies in their flock. They actually do get to see the buddies in the flock for the whole year. So they'll visit each other's nests. I think every single bush tit in a flock knows where every single other bush tit nest is. They hang out in the flock during nest building. So can't build nests all the time. So when they're not building, say later in the, in the day, when um, they're, they're done building, they go and they find their flock mates and they huddle with them at night to stay warm. And once incubation starts, and both, by the way, both male and female do take turns incubating, uh, whoever's not incubating, right, is free to go join the flock and join, find other guys to hang out with. And in, in fact, in Seattle, we used to say, the guy, it seemed like all the males would hang out in one area when they weren't incubating. It was like the part of the bar or something. <laughs> but anyway, so, so that's the most important thing to know about bush tits. Right. So there are a lot of behaviors that arise from this. Some of them are not so nice. So some of the not so nice behaviors that result from these year round flocks is the ability of bush tits, since they know where everybody else's nests are, to steal nesting material. Now, that happened more in Arizona than it does here. I don't see it as much here. But in Arizona, I did have um, several nests, but one nest in particular that had been so compromised by nest material stealing by other bush tits that it, excuse me, fell from the tree. And I think the nestlings, they were 14 days old, just old enough to climb because they usually fledge at 18 days, 
um, and half of them survived, but so that was nice. But anyway, so so that's a risk of ha having your neighbors come visit. Okay. Um, the other thing that I've seen is what we call possible egg dumping or intraspecific brood parasitism, and that is a bush tit from one nest going over, sneaking over, going to another nest when the residents aren't around and laying an egg in the nest. And I saw that, I've seen that twice and twice is a lot for something that like that, um, where the female came in, the, the her mate would stand outside the nest sort of looking around like this. And she, she was in for about 10 to 15 minutes, makes sense, she'd be laying an egg. Then they took off before the residents came back one time. Second time, the residents came back and there was a huge fight in the nest. And it was like, a, it was comical because the nest was like bulging out like this and they were <laughs> So clearly they didn't like having them there. Um, unfortunately, in this situation with the egg dumping, I couldn't verify that the female had laid the eggs, okay? However, since, since 2019, I have been taking blood samples for DNA analysis. So from, that, from 2019 through the present day, through this season, um, we have DNA so that we will be able to detect whether there are eggs from other individuals in the, in the nests. So we'll be able to see that. Very exciting. All right. What else do bush tits do once you have them color banded and you know uh, who's who? Well, there are nest ownership changes, and I'm going to tell you a story that involves this uh, later. Uh, this was not something that I had first observed. Uh, this is something that Steve Irvin, uh, who did his research in California in the 1970s on bush tit flock structure, actually saw. And during the building stage, he noticed that at some nests, he'd see birds A and B there, and then three days later, he'd go back and he'd see birds C and D there building the nest. And since birds can't change color bands, we assume that the owners did change in the nest. Okay, so there were changes in ownership in the nests. And he didn't know why, he just had this wonderful, interesting observation. And it was one of the things that kind of pushed me towards studying bush tits. It's, it's a big mystery why they'd be doing that. And other birds, as far as we know, don't do that. Um, so anyway, in Arizona, I was able to, because I was focusing on nests and not on flock structure, I was able to actually determine, at least for my Arizona birds, why these nest changes were happening. And I found that for the most part, they were due to a nest failure. So if one pair lost their nest, rather than go spend all of that time and energy in building a new nest, Instead, they'd go, they know where all the nests in the area are. Instead, they'd go to the neighbor and they'd attempt to kick the neighbor out. And sometimes they were successful, sometimes they weren't, but sometimes they were successful. And if they were successful, suddenly there was another pair that didn't have a nest. So they'd look around and say, where should we go? And they'd kick out somebody else, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And so you'd end up with this domino effect of nest changes, ownership changes. And in some cases, the original owners would end up being able to boot out the interlopers too. So I've had that happen as well. So the big question is why, right? Other birds don't do that. They lose a nest, they build a new nest. Um, it's because imagine, look at the size of that nest. Think of how much effort goes into building that nest. These are expensive nests. Uh, compared to the size of the bird, this takes a tremendous amount of effort. First nest can take three weeks to build or so. So it's a second nest, not so. They tend to build them very quickly once they lose a nest. But so they're expensive nests. So why not take over the, the giant mansion that's next to you rather than trying to build your own from scratch, right? No, they actually never reuse a nest, although I don't want to say never because we have one nest this year. <laughs> Seriously, the, only the second time I've ever seen a nest reuse. Yeah, and it's really weird. It's like, it's a very strange nest. I kind of wish I had a picture of it, but I don't. Um, where they built into the old nest and then built the out. You have a picture of it with you. Okay, so later, if you want to see a picture of it, it's a really weird looking nest. Okay. Um, this is really less common here than it was in the Chiricahua Mountains in Arizona. And that's because I think 
in um, Oregon, it's just a, a better environment for bush tits. It's not a desert environment. There's plenty of insects, there's plenty of spider webs, there's plenty of lichen, there's plenty of moss. So I think rebuilding the nest is less expensive than trying to kick out your neighbors. And the other thing I actually thought of the other day too is as we, um, as we learn more and more about flock composition, who's in, the, who's in flocks, I think individuals, at least in Portland, Oregon, are, are potentially very closely related to each other. So why would you boot your brother out of a nest, right? Think about it, okay? So, but bas basically I think it's probably just usually because it's just less costly to rebuild a nest in Oregon than it is in the desert environment in Arizona. Mm -hmm. I've rarely seen that, but I did once have a nest where the there were when I, I cut it open when I cut it open because it had been destroyed by a predator, I could see that there was a, another layer below the the eggs that had been laid, and there was another clutch. So that suggests to me that somebody did take that nest over after the first clutch was laid and then then actually put in new material so that to cover up those eggs so they wouldn't be incubating them and then laid their eggs. That's only one once. Yeah. All right. Well, I have a ton of interesting stories about bush tits. In fact, I'm, I'm writing a book right now um, about all those interesting stories. Um, and uh, these stories do illustrate some of the more complicated behaviors. I've only touched the surface here. Um, certainly don't have time for them all here. So what I did is decide to take two um, of the more complicated stories that are nested, no pun intended, within them, um, some of the uh, more, the, the weirder, more interesting behaviors that I've seen bush tits engage in. So the first story is the story of nest one, and it really was nest one. It really was a nest I found first in 2018 and also in 2019. Um, but I want to step back with this story to 2018 first. And this is a nest that, it, this is not the nest. This is just there for illustrative purposes. The nest actually was hanging on a branch. It hung out, looked like a ripe fruit that some predator, find, never, predator never did find it though. Could never figure out why. Anyway, um, in 2018, a male and a female, had two successful broods in that nest. And I'm gonna to refer to these birds by their band combination. So this was green, green, and L is a dark blue over X. And we refer to him as Giggles. They all get names. And his mate was Pixpur, okay? So Giggles and Pixpur, all right? They had two successful broods in that nest in 2018. Then in 2019, when I arrived for my field season, I went to that area and right where the nest had been and the nest was no longer there and there was nothing to indicate that there had been a nest there, I found an unbanded male and Pixpur hopping around and showing some curiosity about the area. And I thought, oh, how sad, Giggles must have died and Pixpur is remated. Uh, that's, that's really sad, but well, that happens. You know, bush shits don't live very long in the wild. Six years is the maximum. I've had them live two to three years is more like it. I went back a few days later and lo and behold, giggles and an unbanded female were hopping around the nest site, the old nest site. And I thought, well, that's really odd, but okay. So I guess they've divorced. They must not be together anymore, which is unusual. Usually if both the male and female survive the winter, they do nest together. So this was very unusual. I thought, okay, what's going on? All right, so I went back a few days later and an unbanded male and an unbanded female were finally building a nest right where the old nest had been. And I'm getting really confused, right? Yes. So back in 2018, they had two successful mm -hmm. They have more than one Oh, oh, sure. I'm sorry. Uh, yes, they. Uh, the question was, do bush tits are they double brooded? Do they have two two nests? Yes. If they breed early enough in the season, and that the first nest is successful, they will have a second brood. Um, this year is really weird. We're very late this year. We don't have any feeding nests yet. Only incubate, just starting incubation. 
I don't think they're going to have time for a second brood this year. But yeah, usually they do. So now finally we have a nest building. They're building a nest right where the old nest was, but it's the unbanded male and the unbanded female. So now, now I'm getting confused, right? Okay. I go back a few days later and the nest has been taken over by Giggles and Pixpur. And they are now happily building the nest and who knows what's happened to the unbanded male and the female. But that's not the end of the story. Actually, <laughs> the story gets a little sad now. Yes, I'm sorry. Um, what happened was during incubation, Pixper disappeared. Apparently she died. Um, she had been observed with her leg uh, glued essentially to her body, which I have seen in a few birds. Um, and she couldn't get around very well. She would go in to incubate, but I'm pretty sure that she wasn't getting enough food. She wasn't able to forage properly. And so I assume that she died. Um, if you wanna know more about the sticky substance, I'll tell you about that after the, the talk, if we wanna know about that. So Giggles abandoned the nest after about a week. He would go in and incubate for a while and then he'd leave and he just decided that he was done with it. So I assumed that that nest was going to be abandoned for the rest of the season. But about three weeks later, an unbanded male and an unbanded female returned. And I have that in quotes because if they're unbanded, you don't know who they are. You don't know if it's the same unbanded male and unbanded female. Nonetheless, they came back, they fixed up the nest, they laid eggs and they hatched a brood and they were happily feeding them when along came Giggles. Giggles returned to the nest by himself and started to feed the babies at the nest. So he, he helped raise the brood as a helper. Remember in the very beginning of this talk, we talked about bush tits being one of the first birds described as having helpers. Here's Giggles behaving as a helper. <laughs> All right, so just to remind you, a, a, a helper is an individual that directs parental behaviors at offspring that are not their own offspring. And we assume that Giggles was feeding kids that were not his own. However, we have his blood. We have the blood of the nestlings. Remember it was 2019. Maybe he is the dad of a couple of those babies. So the mystery will be solved, we hope. All right. So in Arizona, um, I had quite a few, 37% of the nests had an extra bird at the nest, had a helper at the nest, at least one. One nest actually had six males and one female feeding at the nest. And doing a nest watch on that nest was a nightmare. They were all color banded. And I was just like writing down that as fast as I could, 58 feedings in half an hour. So it was absolutely insane. After that brood fledged successfully, which is hard to believe because there's so much action at a nest like that, you'd think a predator would say, whoa, look at all that going on over there. There must be some goodies in that nest, but they didn't find it. They had a second brood. Three of the males went off with the fledglings and two, three of the males came back and actually uh, had another nest with this female. So there were four birds at the second nest. Usually, however, these helpers are only a single male at the nest. And why males? Oh, right. And I was going to say in Portland, Portland, I'm getting only about 7% of the nests with extra birds. So it's a much, it's a different system. It's also a different subspecies, by the way, because this is Saltriparus minimus here in Oregon and in um, a minimus minimus. And in Oregon, it was Salt Saltriparus minimus plumbius. So two different subspecies. So I don't know whether it's due to the environment or whether it's due to genetics. Okay, but the helpers are by, by far more likely to be males than they are to be females. I have a few extra females at nests. And in the years that when I was doing my dissertation and I had absolutely every single bush tit in two flocks banded so that I could look at sex ratios. You can see that the sex ratio, this is a green, the number of males, in each year and the number of females, the sex ratio is always skewed in favor of males. So there are always extra males in the population looking for something to do. All right, so why do bush tits or any other bird become helpers? Why don't they go get their own nests, okay? 
Um, or if they can't find a female, why don't they just laze around and get nice and healthy and not bother going through all of the um, stress of being a parent? Any of you who's a parent knows it can be stressful. Um, and the most common explanation is that they may be joining relatives. And if you join a relative and you help a relative raise their kids, so for example, help your brother raise his kids, then you are helping, you're still putting your genes into the next generation. So you have more genes in common with your close relatives than you do with strangers. So if you're helping a close relative, then you are passing on your genes indirectly, not directly through your own kids, but indirectly through your relatives' kids. And so it's making the best of a bad situation if you can't find a mate of your own. And this is called, often called kin selection. And by far, that's the most common um, explanation, or at least uh, most of the scientists like to look at research from that perspective. But in bush tits, I think there's something a little more complicated going on. And that doesn't mean that kin selection is not a factor in bush tits. So we'll find out when we do the DNA um, exactly what's going on. But in bush tits, they usually join as an extra bird, as a helper during feeding, during the feeding stage of the very first brood at the nest. And they don't do it uncontested. The resident male will try to chase the intruding male off. And then eventually, and he doesn't do it very well because within a few days, the intruding male is feeding at the nests. Actually, weirdly, they first start bringing in nesting material. So they must bring in the nesting material and they come out with it and they go, huh, nobody ate that. Anyway, they eventually come in with food. And eventually, you can't tell the two males apart in behavior. They, they, they are identical. They're both feeding at the same rate. Um, so what happens then at, after this one fledges is at the second nest, you can't tell the difference between the two males. They both incubate. They both feed. And so what I'm thinking is happening is the, both males are probably mating with the female for the second nest. And so this time what we brought really is a polyandrous trio. We don't really have a helper at the nest. What we really have is two males mating with one female. And so that's a polyandrous trio. And this may be the reason why they join in the first brood because, hey, you know, I'll get a, I'll get a foot in the door and the next nest, I'll be a dad, right? Okay, so that's one thing, helpers at the nest. The other thing I see in bush tits um, is paired males, that is males that have an existing nest, um, aggressively visiting other males' nests during the egg laying period of that other nest. So what, it's, this often happens once, where we think it happens, once the male's nest, the, once the nest of his own is incubating. And so if his female is incubating, he takes off while she's incubating, goes to a neighbor's nest, aggressively chases the female, aggressively chases the male, harassing the female, um, chasing the male and the female. And we assume that he's, what he's trying to do is mate with her, okay? And if he does, it's called an extra pair copulation. So that's mating outside of the pair bond. And if, it's, if that happens, it could result in a, what we call a multi-paternity nest. So I remember I talked about Giggles possibly being the dad at the nest that he was helping at. Well, we think that these aggressive interactions might indeed be um, males trying to mate with fem neighboring females. And um, this remarkably blurry picture, which actually is remarkably blurry even if the screen was, wasn't a little weird, um, is an amazing photograph. Um, it's the only photograph I have of an parent extra pair copulation. And it was taken by a student at Reed College who had just gotten a camera for his birthday, knew nothing about birds, was walking around campus and saw these birds behaving weirdly and took this picture. Now it's a blurry picture, but I can tell, actually in, when it's in better shape, I can tell, I know who this female is. She's in a mating posture with her tail up, like in a receptive posture. This male is clearly courting her. They may have made it already. I don't know or they're going to mate. And this male has no bands. Her mate does have bands. So this is not her mate. This is another male. So this is the only picture I have and the only time that anyone has ever actually observed an extra pair copulation, what appears to be an extra pair copulation. 
However, when I was when I gave this talk at Portland, somebody in the audience said that they had seen at their bird feeder a male mate with one female and then immediately go over to another female and mate with her. So a male mate with two females. So that's the second observation in 36 years. So I've been studying these birds for 36 years now. So anyway, so this is a remarkable photograph. And he was delighted that, that I was so excited about that photograph. This next photograph is also incredibly exciting. The other thing we see in bush tits is extremely aggressive interactions between females. Um, it seems to be that females are far more aggressive with each other than uh, males are. And uh, Chuck Schussman sent me this incredible video. It's a very short video of these two females fighting. They had been way up in the air fighting and then they fell to the ground and were knocked out and he thought they were dead. And he went over and he started videotaping them and then they woke up and they fought for a little bit and then they separated. But you probably can't see this, but I'm gonna point it out. This female's leg has this female's beak completely wrapped in it. And the same is true of this female's leg wrapped around this one's beak. And then they've got their, their other legs entwined. So this is just an amazing <laughs> photograph. So, and this is something, it seems that when we see really truly aggressive interactions, it tends to be the females that are behaving more aggressively towards each other. And just to point out, females are the ones with these crazy yellow eyes. And when I hold them in hand, their pupils dilate. Like, I mean, they get small and they get large and small and large when I'm holding them in the hand. Um, it's doesn't, it makes sense to me that something's going on with females that we just don't know about and that this is a communicatory um, uh, characteristic of bush tits, of female bush tits. Okay. So the last story I'm going to tell you is the story of Rex Rug. Wow, I can't believe how good his bands turned out on this particular photograph. Um, this photograph was one, also by one of my field assistants, by Amit Gordon. And uh, Rex Rug was a remarkable bird, um, followed him for several years. And uh, his territory, his area, is this northern area of the Oaks Bottom Wildlife Refuge. And in... This is where I need the, this thing here, be able to know, because I have slide ins here. All right, all right. So he established a nest in 2018 that was uh, here with a female, and it was an unbanded female, nest one. And we, oh, no, 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 I'm sorry, I have to back up. That was the next year. This is 2018. We banded three birds at this nest, two males and a female. It was a feeding nest when I found them. They were very close to fledging. I was incredibly lucky to band them. Um, and he was one of that trio. So he was, a, a, he was one of two males and a female at the nest, a three bird nest, which fledged only two days later. So I was very lucky to find them and band them, followed them for a while and could, I, could verify that all three birds were indeed feeding even the fledglings, not just at the nest. And then later in the season, they disappeared as fledglings often do, have no idea where they went because it's the suburbs, they can't go into people's backyards. And so I don't always know where my birds go. Um, and later in the season, he was found feeding at nest two, which was about, I'd say about 200 meters away from this first nest. And this nest was a little weird because an unbanded female joined them and started feeding at the nest. So we had two females and a male feeding at this nest. Um, this was in 2018 before I was taking blood samples. So I have no idea if both females actually laid eggs in the nest or not. And then it fledged on May 31st. So that was Rex Rugg's uh, story for 2018. In 2019, things got really weird. Okay, so let me see if I can set this up properly. Right, all right. So in 2019, I found Rex Rug building a nest with a, an unbanded female, which we banded as URCX, um, pretty close to the second nest that he had in 2018. 
And simultaneously, there was another nest about 200 meters away um, that was being built by a young male, XR. So he only had two bands. I only put two bands usually on the kids because they don't usually survive. But remember, I told you five survived this. Anyway, um, so we've got uh, XR, an unbanded female, building at that nest. Okay. So what happened next was once this female, Rex Rugg's female was incubating eggs, he abandoned her and he went and he took over this nest completely so that he was rebuilding this nest or building at this nest with an unbanded female simultaneously while his first female was incubating the eggs. And um, this at this nest, we don't know if it's the same female that was there with XR or whether it was a different female, we have no idea. But one of the weird things that happened was XR kind of hung around, like we kept seeing him every time we did a nest watch here, we'd see him sort of lurking about. And I was really curious as to what in the world he was doing there because normally when they get booted out of a nest, they go elsewhere and he was still in the area. All right, so net, when nest one hatched, remember that's Rex Rugg's original nest. And when it did, he returned, he left this female alone, abandoned her and returned to feed at his original nest. And this poor female, it isn't this forwarding, there we go. Eventually, by the way, raising two broods in that first nest leaving the unbanded female to incubate by herself. Okay, so it is possible. Right. And while she was incubating, we had a surprise, an embarrassing surprise, because we found a third nest only about 75 feet away from the second nest. And that was like, oh, how did we not see it? It was really super obvious. Not only was it obvious, but that had... It was being fed by four birds, one of whom was XR. So XR, that's the mystery, solves the mystery of why XR was around. And the nestlings were incredibly loud. So how did we miss that nest? And it's only because it was so close, I think, to this other nest. We just didn't, or didn't have our you know, radar on for a nest nearby. So anyway, the nestlings were incredibly loud. They were being fed by four birds, one of whom was XR. We did eventually ban those birds. Um, but the mystery was that not only were there loud nestlings in the nest, but they were also carrying out tiny fecal sacs. And you may or may not know that young nestlings produce these fecal sacs that the parents can pick up, carry out of the nest and drop and keep the nest clean that way. Once they get older, though, they stop producing the fecal sacs and the parents can't really carry out the feces anymore. And so the nest gets dirty. So we had these loud nestlings who seemed to be almost fledging age. They were so loud and yet they were still carrying out tiny fecal sacs. And so I was really puzzled. I couldn't figure out what was going on. So I watched that nest every single day thinking, should I fledge the kids? Should I fledge the kids? We didn't have hatch date. So I didn't know how old they were. I didn't want to fledge them prematurely, but I can fledge them artificially by putting a bag over the entrance and bopping the nest and they'll fledge into the bag if I, if I do that. Sometimes I do that with second nests. I never do it with first broods because I'm afraid they won't reuse the nest. They'll see it as a, a predation event. But anyway, so I'm just thinking, what should I do? What should I do? What should I do? And then while I was waiting, they fledged. But I thought, oh, darn. And two of the birds one male and one female joined the fledglings and went off into the pasture. I could hear them. And I was like, ah, I can't believe I missed that nest. I really wanted to get blood from those birds and ban them and find out what's going on. Because remember, this is 2019. I'm taking blood samples. But then XR and the female showed up with food, went into the nest and fed babies. And I could hear really tiny, very young nestlings. So this was a nest that had two broods in it were very different ages, okay? So XR and the female continued to feed those guys, very young nestlings. And this poor female at two 
was now feeding all by herself. She had successfully incubated the brood after being abandoned by Rex Rug. And now she was feeding them and she looked like she hadn't had a bath and I don't know how long. She looked really looked bedraggled and she was constantly trying to feed these kids by herself. She was exhausted. The kids were super loud and XR began to feed at both nests. XR began to feed here for 20 minutes and there for 20 minutes and he'd, he'd go back and forth. So he fed at both nests. Um, we do have the blood from all of these birds. And so we will hopefully be able to answer the question of whether XR actually was a father maybe at both nests, who knows? But anyway, so this was the, I've never again seen a male feed at two nests at the same time. It was the only time I ever saw it. So the most interesting takeaway from Rex Rugg's story, okay? By the way, he did breed the following year in 2020, but he just was a normal guy. He had two nests, had one female, had one nest, that, that fledged, and then he had a second nest, and that fledged, he was Mr. Boring. <laughs> so, and then he disappeared. So as all bush tits do eventually. All right, but the, the most interesting thing about that complicated story is that Rex Rugg had two nests simultaneously. He developed, he uh, established one nest, the female began to incubate, he took that opportunity to go boot out another male, take over that nest, and when she was incubating, went back and was a dutiful dad at the first nest. And I doubt very seriously that the second female had any idea that he had already had a nest or she would she have she would have nested with him. I don't think so. All right. So I this I actually think, although it was a new behavior when I saw it, when I started looking back at some of the data from previous years, I actually don't think it's that uncommon a behavior. There were many situations where I had lone females feeding at a nest. I mean, and again, they looked bedraggled, they were exhausted. It was clearly a very costly thing for them to do. And I, and I knew the male, and, but the male had disappeared. And I usually thought, oh, poor guy died and now she's all alone. But then later in the season, I'd found him, find him gallivanting somewhere else or he'd show up the next year. And I'd think, wait a minute, he didn't die. He's still around. So why wasn't he helping her feed the nest? Now I'm beginning to think, that this is a situation where this was a second female who was abandoned by a male who had um, uh, taken over the nest. Um, and it occurred to me now that some of these aggressive male visitations, remember we're talking about males trying to mate with neighboring females, may actually also be, or instead be, who knows, males attempting a complete takeover of the nest. And maybe the, you know, the Second prize is mating with the female and having a few eggs in the nest, but maybe first prize is chasing off the male entirely and being able to have it as a second nest. So this is kind of a, a list of this complex bush tit sociality, all by the way, due to the fact that they have these flocks that exist year round, okay? So this, this year round flock affiliation, I just want to point out that the ones that I find most interesting are the nest ownership changes, the helpers at the nest, which we don't know if they're just helpers or maybe they're also parents, aggressive male visitations, okay, and this males with two nests. And of course, there's a whole slew of other things that they do that are, you can't do if you don't live in a flock that exists year round. Okay, what we're doing now, well, we have four years of blood samples, and this is the only picture you'll ever see of me in a laboratory ever again. I absolutely hated that, the lab work. I love field work, but lab work's not my thing. Um, in March, we went to the Fuller Lab at the Cornell Laboratory of Ornithology, took our four years of DNA, and uh, set it up to be um, go through this process called double D rad sequencing using this very new technique. It's a much better technique than simply being able to tell who's the dad and who's who not the dad, just paternity exclusion, which you, I guess you can die those at, buy those at drugstores now, right? Not for bush tits though, <laughs> but okay. <laughs> Um, we'll actually be able to tell relatedness among individuals with flo within flocks. We'll be able to tell whose cousins, whose sisters, brothers, fathers, mothers, et cetera, et cetera. 
Um, and also, I'm very interested in looking at close neighbors. So do individuals who are more closely related to each other nest closer to each other? We'll be able to look at that. And of course, we'll be able to look at paternity and maternity at all nests too, whether we've got more than one male or female in nesting. Did you have a question? Yeah, I just touched on DNA and I was kind of curious. How long did it take to build up some kind of a database to know what the Well, we took, we've got four years of, <laughs> oh, I'm sorry, because of the Zoom, right. You're asking me how long it took to build up a database so that we can make these kinds of comparisons. Well, with this double DRAD sequencing, we actually don't need to do that. Um, it's not like uh, the old microsatellite DNA stuff where you had, to you had just a few areas in the DNA that you could compare between two individuals. This apparently produces thousands, am I right, Ian? Right. Oh, we don't need a full genome. It actually creates its own kind of genome using all of the samples that we have available to us. So it's, um, it's really different from the other um, uh, earlier kinds of DNA analyses. Well, I'm ignorant about that too. <laughs> I'm curious, it seems like a really, uh, yeah. Well, I, I'm super excited about this. I mean, I was going to do the DNA analyses before COVID hit, and I had had funding through somebody else, through a collaborator, David Westney, down at the University of Kentucky. And because of COVID, that fell through. But I have all, had all the blood, but this wasn't available then. And what he would have done would, may not have been adequate for bush tits because we think they're very, these flocks are very closely related to each other. Individuals are closely related to each other. So now just because of COVID, thank you COVID, it got put off for several years. I collected more blood and then we, were, we had the opportunity to use this new sequencing technique, which is much more detailed than the older techniques. Yes. I'm also curious because you know, you're capturing the birds. Are you using um, mist nets mm -hmm. at, the, at the nest site? Yes. Oh, I'm sorry. How are we capturing the birds? Yes. The adults we capture with using mist nets and playbacks of bush tits because bush tits love bush tits. So it's easy to call them into the nets that way. And we do it near the nest. We don't do it very close to the nest though. Okay. I'm very careful about not being too close to the nest. Yeah. Um, okay, so what are we doing now? There's continuing research. Obviously, I'm continuing my observations. Um, I'm kind of an old-fashioned natural historian. I consider myself an old-fashioned behavioral ecologist. Watching the birds for long periods of time is the way that I like to gather information. So I'm continuing my observations, blood collection, uh, to uh, further understand what turns out to be, I think, a really complex and fascinating system. And every single year, there are more questions. Every single year, I learn more about them. And so it's not something that's like, oh, I've learned everything. I know everything about bush tits. I don't. I mean, I know I would love for somebody to do the eye color in females, well, a, a, a graduate student. Oh, gee. <laughs> In what, in what respect? What is my observation protocol or routine? Gee, we find as many nests as we possibly can within the study area. And then we monitor the nest depending on the stage of the nest and we try to color band all of the adults. Once the adults are color banded, then we continue to observe them. The only way to determine whether or not a nest is hatched is for the birds to go from carrying nesting material into the nest to carrying food into the nest. We can't look in the nests the way you can an open cup nest. So that's very critical, finding out hatch date because there's always just a window of time that you have that you can ban the babies without having them fledge prematurely or having them too small to band. So that's critical, finding hatch date. And uh, so it's basically observations. And, and then we, I do a little C-section on the nest because you can't get into the nest any other way. The parents don't care. They, they don't even notice. I, I go up, we cut a little, I cut a little slit. I take out half the babies, pinch it shut, 
go process them. In the meantime, the parents can sit, continue to feed the kids in the nest because they can't count. <laughs> and then I switch them out, do the other half, parents continue, and then I clip it shut with these little hair clips that have been spray painted so that it's cryptic. And if they have two broods, I often go in, the second brood, I'll unclip it and it will have been completely repaired. So it's, and, and surprisingly, the birds don't seem to mind that um, we do that. Um, so there are a couple of projects that are uh, besides mine that continues. Uh, also Ian Connolly, who's here, is gonna be a grad student at the University of Kentucky. And he is going to be looking at um, who the male nest, the male nest visitors are and whether or not they're contributing genetically. So he's actually gonna be the one who's gonna do the laborious process of taking all of the blood samples that have now run through this double D rad sequencing and now need to go through a lot of computer stuff before we actually get answers. It's not as simple as it sounds. Thank goodness I don't have to do that. Um, Ian is also working with a postdoc, um, Matt uh, Milivsk, Milivsk who, who speaks Polish. There was somebody in the audience last time who did. Milevsky, I think it is. Matt Milevsky, uh, he's a postdoc at the University of Louisville, and they are looking at the um, nest site fidelity or nesting hotspot. Remember giggles? Remember how they, those birds were very interested in that exact same spot? That is not unusual at all. Um, it's very common for us to say, oh, yeah, there was a nest in that tree. Oh, there's a nest. In fact, a funny story is one year I said, the very first nest that I ever found on Reed campus was right here. And then I went and there was a nest right there. <laughs> it was years later. So they seem to prefer certain spots. And it isn't obvious. It's not micro. We don't think it's microclimate or anything. I think it's probably social. Anyway. So they're looking at this nest site fidelity and uh, nesting hotspots um, project. And finally, I just wanna thank or acknowledge my team Bush Tit for 2023. It changes every year. This is Ian. He's gonna, he's gonna be a graduate student next year at the University of Kentucky working with the Bush Tits as I've already men mentioned. Jeffrey Harris has been, a, it's his first year on the project. Jillian Murphy, is. this is her second year on the project. She'll be going into grad school in 2024, working with cooperatively breeding acorn woodpeckers. Um, Matt Milovsky has been a bander for us for now a couple of years. We have a new bander, Katie Baker. She's a student, uh, master's student at um, uh, Portland State University. And then one of my students from the University of Maine at Farmington, who was also with us in Cornell doing the lab work, just arrived a few days ago as an assistant and I'll be having another student. I don't have her picture up there yet um, joining us. So I wanted to acknowledge them. So thank you. Okay, more questions. So. About a sticky substance that was detrimental and I was just wondering what Okay, the question is, I talked about a sticky substance that was detrimental, right, and uh, caused the birds to have this gluing on them. Um, we started to notice that a few years ago, and um, it, uh, it was a puzzle for me until I found a uh, Department of Agriculture insect trap, sticky traps, were in the woods, and um, I to their credit, I called them that day because somebody had found, it was a mystery for a while. And somebody had called me and said they had found a dead bush tit in their yard. And so I, we went and we saw this dead bush tit and it had its legs stuck. So I took the bird into to the Audubon Rehabilitation Place in Portland and they looked at it, said it seemed to be a perfectly healthy bird, but with the sticky stuff that was you know, preventing it from foraging. And so, um, so I called the Department of Agriculture and told them about the problem, said, look, you know, you think this hole that's this big is not going to allow a bird in, but it's big enough for a bush tit to get in apparently. And they replaced them all immediately. But I think there's a greater problem. A lot of people use a sticky substance to keep ants off of certain plants, to keep um, ants out of their house. Uh, and they sell it at Home Depot. And it's, I think it's illegal in some states. It's not, it should be illegal because small birds 
insectivorous birds will go down, it will catch insects, they'll go down, they'll get it on themselves, and then that's, you know, a real problem from there, so. Yes. Yes, the, the question is, have you ever thought about putting cameras embedded in the nest? Yes, they've thought about lots of things like that. Um, I, I tried to use a scope, you know, like an endoscope to look in the nest to see like what stage the nest was at. And um, that didn't work because there's so many feathers, for example, so you can't really see what's going on. Um, I've thought about, we, we actually have cameras that we're going to be putting up um, for just to at the entrance to be able to see who's going in and out because you can see their color bands pretty readily when they pop into the nest and then go into the nest, they kind of show their legs. Um, we've thought also about using pit tags. Have you ever heard of pit tags? It's a, well, I don't know, it's like a little transmitter about the size of a grain of rice that you can glue onto a band on a bird's leg. And then if you have a, um, a, re a receiver around the entrance of the nest. Every time they go in and out, it'll be recorded. We've thought about all kinds of crazy things, but we have our hands full just watching the nests. <laughs> yes. So the question is, is helping more likely in younger birds, right? Than in older birds. And I don't really know the answer to that one, quite honestly. Um, in, there are so many birds, especially in Oregon, there are so many birds because I'm living, I'm working in a suburban environment. Every year I come back to a lot of unbanded birds. So I don't know how old they are. I don't know whether they're second year birds or whether they're um, older than that. So um, I don't really know the answer to that. I do know that in Arizona, when I had a lot of birds banded, we still didn't have much survival over the winter of juveniles. And so the helpers were not necessarily juveniles or first year birds in their first breeding season, but it did turn out that younger birds were more likely to have their nests taken over, which makes sense. And also this year, we think we have a lot of very young birds because the nests, I mean, the nests just look so bad. They're, it's like they don't know what they're doing, you know? <laughs> And so I think this year we have a, a preponderance of way more young birds than we have in the past, proportionally. Yes. Something I've often wondered about based on the number of nests I've seen, how close do these nests are likely to be to each other? And how big of an area would a flock's nesting reasonably be? Um, I could close this. Open this and show you if you wait one second. Every time I've seen a nest, there's just a single nest. I didn't see any other. No, I'm not connected to the internet, so I can't. Sorry. But if I were connected to the internet, I could show you our nest this year. How, I'm sorry, how close are nests to each other? That's a good question. What do you think? Uh, like. 100 meters, 200 meters, something like that. Yeah. I mean, it depends on the density. Like last year, we only found 65 nests. This year, we've already found 55 or so, 50 or 60 nests. Most years, I find 100, about 100 nests over the year during the breeding season. So um, when, they're, when they're a greater density, the nests are definitely closer to each other than years where there are fewer bush tits and they're pretty far apart, far further apart from each other. More questions? Yes. <laughs> yeah. Are there any tips or tricks for finding a bush tit nest? Yes. Follow the bush tits and follow them until they carry nesting material. And as soon as they have nesting material or food, because they may be in the feeding stage, put your binoculars down because you'll never be able to follow them with your binoculars, right? Put your binoculars down and follow them and they'll take you to their nest. That's how we find them. It's probably how predators find them too. <laughs> okay. Yes. 
Yeah. Somebody asked if my research has been published in Cornell Birds of the World. Yes, my I am the sole author of the Birds of the World um, chapter, I guess you'd call it, on bush tits. Yes, on bush tits. I'm the sole author of that. Yes. More questions? Yes. Thanks. I often wonder about how much you need to put on the birds and expect them to carry around on their legs. I wonder if there's you know, a payload for this, or for a bird that can handle it. Right. The, the question is. The question is, what is a payload that a bird can handle? And I don't know the answer to that. But I do know that it my I don't feel that my birds are impaired by the bands that are on their legs. I certainly have birds that banded birds that have lived for six years, five or six years. Rex Rugg, you know, he was a real character. Um, I, I don't think that it affects them. I I mean, you know, all anybody who who handles birds and puts bands on their legs is always thinking in the back of their minds, these birds are gonna be wearing these for the rest of their lives. And that does give me pause. It definitely gives me pause. But as I wouldn't be doing it if I didn't feel that there was some greater good that's gonna come out of it. And the greater good that I feel is gonna come out of it, I think in, in addition to my, my scientific publications, which none of you probably will ever read except for maybe the birds of the world, right? Um, is that is this book that I'm writing. And I hope that that will reach not only birders, but people who are interested in animals and they'll see how interesting the lives of these little, in, these little birds are and they will carry that through to other animals as well and care more about the natural environment and the animals that, exist, that live in them. So I feel that I feel that um, there's some justification if in some way I am affecting them. I feel, and I, I, I do think maybe I might be a tiny bit, you know, I don't have any evidence to that, to that, but I always in the back of my mind, I don't like banding them, but the information that I'm getting is. Yeah. Very little. I, I actually took them in. I had three different kinds to, to choose from. And I took them into a pot store. And, and I said, could you weigh these bands for me? Because <laughs> they have these really precise scales. And, and I don't remember how much they weighed, but it was infinitesimal. I mean, it was really, really a small. They were, they, oh, it, not even, I, I don't even remember what it was. I remember it was, I was shocked at how little they weighed. Yeah. Yes. Have I noticed anything surprising or unusual about what they eat? Um, a lot of people have been commenting lately, uh, other people as well, about uh, them getting into flowers and getting nectar and getting yellow on their faces so they look like little verdans. Um, <laughs> uh, I, in Arizona, I did have them eating willow seeds and they are primarily insectivorous birds, but they will eat, will eat very small seeds if they come into them. And especially in the winter, I think when they've, they, the insects are relatively sparse, especially. Interesting. That's interesting. Yeah. But the chips. Okay. I've never seen that. Wow. I've seen them. Yeah. I don't. That's interesting. Thank you. He just, I just heard that bush tits will eat sunflower chips whole. I've never heard of that, but it, I wouldn't be surprised. Yeah. Um, I use uh, uh, the smallest needle you can possibly imagine. And well, I, I can't pretend that this is really the bird's wing and I'm going to pretend this is a bird's wing. Okay. And I go to the brachial vein and I just puncture it a tiny bit and up bubbles a little bit of blood and gets sucked up into a capillary tube and the capillary tube and the blood get put into a lysis buffer and shake, shaken up. Don't take very much blood at all. In fact, the amount of blood that I'm allowed to take um, by animal welfare is a certain percentage. I can't remember what it is, but it turns out to be only 20 microliters of blood from a 5.5 gram bird. And I now only need to take about five. We, with this new DNA technique, I only need about five micrograms. I mean, my, microliters. Yes. Do you know whether the color 
Yeah. Do I ever wonder if the color colors of the bands is something predators can see? That's something those of us who use color bands wonder about a lot. Um, we wonder about not only predators, but whether or not the color of the bands affects the bird's relationships with other bush tits. So imagine female bush tits have yellowish eyes. If a female bush tit has yellow bands, is that something that's going to make her into a super bush tit or something? You know, I mean, we don't really know whether it has an effect. Studies in the past on zebra finches showed, um, and they were in captivity, showed that there was an effect of color bands on mate choice, for example. Um, so I do think color bands could potentially have an effect, yes. I'm not sure about predators, though. I think most predators are not um, color. I don't think they have very good color vision. So, I, you know, for them, the uh, bush hits are rarely, I think, attacked by predators. I think they're so small, they're so agile, and they're in the bushes. Um, the nests are much more likely to be uh, affected by predation than the bush tits themselves. Yes. Who are their primary predators? Who are their primary predators? <laughs> Depends on whether you ask me or Gary Granger at Reed College. He studies crows, so he doesn't think they're crows, but I think they're crows. <laughs> I think all the corvids, certainly crows by far, um, they're smart. They can figure out how to follow bush tits to their nest just as easily as we can. Nice little plump little packages of protein. Um, and uh, uh, probably any of the other corvids are predators, but also I think squirrels, raccoons, um, th that's what Gary thinks. Gary thinks it's the gray squirrels on Reed campus. Reed campus has a predation rate of about 85%. Yeah, really, really high. Last year and the previous year, I think, was really high. Um, whereas the more natural area, Oaks Bottom Wildlife Refuge, which doesn't have so many gray squirrels in it, for example, but doesn't have as many crows either, um, predation rates are about 13%. So that's a huge difference. Yeah. When you say predation, of the nests. Yeah, the nests just get shattered, you know, torn apart by predators usually. Yeah. More questions? Why do they stay there in nests if they keep losing all the nests in that one area and just down the road here? That's a nice uh, area where we don't have predation. Well, the question is why don't bush tits move to areas where their predation is lower? Well, I think what happened, like this year, I said a lot, we think a lot of the birds are new young birds that have come into the area. They don't know. You know, they don't, they don't know there was predation there. All they know is they hatched, they, they survived, they joined the flock, they were with the flock during the winter, and wow, there's this great area over there that's for me to put a nest, so I think I'll go put a nest over there. In fact, it, it's a really good question because there's one area that I can think of, if I think of several areas, but there's one in particular where every single year we have a nest in exactly the same place, and every single year that nest gets destroyed by a predator every single year they haven't had a single successful nest in that spot and yet every year there's a nest there no it's not the same birds right other questions yes you mentioned um what's the giving the decline of the population in the mm -hmm. um, is there as inside populations in general with kind of decline is there a similar population trend elsewhere uh, you asked if there were similar population trends in bush tits elsewhere. I don't really actually know whether or not there are. And one of the one of the problems with trying to assess that is that most of the information comes from eBird. And other than people like me who are actually watching a population and are embedded in the population, we get information from eBird. And I think that and the eBird, of course, is volunteer and it varies in quality. For you know, some people are really good at, at identifying birds and counting them, and some people aren't. But the other thing is, bush tits are. You know, maybe you've had this experience. You can go out in the field and do a nice birding walk and never see a bush tit, right? Or the same walk the next day, you go out and there are fifty bush tits, right? So bush tits have such large home ranges that I think it's very difficult to assess what the population size is. And so eBird isn't a very good. Um, way to assess it. Neither are the Christmas bird counts, for example. You either run into them or you don't. I think a better 
measure of bush tit, the health of a bush tit population besides the number of nests, which nobody's doing other than me, um, is to actually count the size of the flocks. So if you run into a flock and it's a, a 10 bird flock and it's December, and that's not sounding so good. You run into a flock in December and it's 50 birds. I think the po population's doing well, um, but not everybody counts birds in a flock properly. Of course, you know, you have to count them as they move from like from tree to tree or across the road. One, two, three, four, five, six. That's the best way. You can't just eyeball it. Oh, I think there are 30 bush tits. You really need to count them. So I don't know. That's, I really don't know, but I would imagine that anywhere where insect abundance is dropping due to droughts, for example, that all insectivorous birds must be declining, but it, in particular, the resident insectivorous birds, the ones that are not moving from place to place, probably kinglets and things like that as well. Yes. Any recommendations on plants? Huh. So you're asking what's the average size of a bush tit flock and also are there plants that you can that you can plant that would attract bush tits? Um, I would say bush tits are, bush tits don't care. As long as it's not wooded, they, they I, would, I would say you don't really, they'll nest in just about anything. I mean, I have one nesting in a rose bush this big out in front of my house. Um, I have bush tits nesting at the top of a Douglas fir one year. I mean, they nest in all kinds of crazy places. Um, the size of the flock depends a lot on the time of the year. So later in the season, we get big flocks where you get the fledglings joining. And because everybody, all the fledglings and all the adults within the flock will, will flock together. But they'll also splinter off into subflocks as well. So I'd say the average size of a bush tit flock is anywhere between 10 and 50. You know, it's, it depends very much on the weather and it depends very much on how successful they've been that year. And the Chiricahuas, I would have said 20 because I studied for my dissertation. I studied that those two flocks for four years and I always had about 20 to 25 birds in the flock and that was it. But this is a different place. Oh, what kind of plants? I don't think it matters. Um, Put up a suet feeder. <laughs> you want bush tits in your yard, put up a suet feeder. And apparently also sunflower chips. <laughs> I didn't know about that. Um, so I, I, I think the best, the best habitat for a bush tit is, is sort of low brush. You know, they like um, small trees. They don't like heavily wooded areas. Um, they're, they, they really like suburban backyards. That if, think about a, a suburban backyard without a lot of grass. That, that's a bush tit habitat. That's why you see them all the time in your backyards, right? Yeah. I'm curious because you know, in the winter, you have your suet. The other thing they really like is bark butter that's maybe sold to wild birds. Oh, okay. Suet and bark butter you know, in the cages. All right. Bush tit. But again, one day they could have you know, 12, and the next day maybe 20. So are these probably two different mm. flocks that you're getting from? Okay, so the question is if you have, um, say, a different size flocks arriving on different days, is it two different flocks or is it part? And I, I can't answer that question. It's possible that the 12 bush tits that came in were, a mem were members of that larger flock and you only got 12 of them coming in. On nicer days, they tend to split up into smaller flocks. On really cold days, they tend to stay, especially in the winter, they tend to stay in really big flocks. And I think that's because of, for warmth, for huddling at night. And at night, the flock, and we're talking about big flocks and even, um, neighboring flocks sometimes come to the same area, which is very well sheltered and will nest and will uh, huddle together to stay warm. On really cold nights, do they go into cavities? I don't know the answer to that question. I know that long-tailed tits, which are the closest relative to bush tits in Europe, do that. 
So I wouldn't be surprised at all if bush tits go into cavities, but they do not use their nests in the winter. Even if the nest looks perfectly lovely and warm and whatever, they don't seem to ever go into the nest in the winter. Even if it's still hanging, and sometimes is. Other questions? Okay, well, thank you. Oh, right.